So I will talk to you today about the rise and fall of agricultural biodiversity through globalization. If it will. Okay, very good. I hope you can all see. So it's um, a kind of particular focus on agriculture, uh, a bit different angle from what you've seen uh, so far. Uh, I guess you have you've had a, a course on on the political aspects of agri agriculture, and now we'll talk about biodiversity today. So perhaps. Uh, some of you have learned at school, as I did, that agriculture was born uh, about 12,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, uh, actual Syria. Um, it's actually um, one of the cradle of agriculture, but it's not the only one. Agriculture was born in many different places in the world at different times and in an independent way. There was not li no links between the different uh, green zone that you can see here in the map. Uh, and each of this birth of agri agriculture uh, took a different forms, a different form with uh, different plants, different animals that were domesticated. And you can see all the, the red arrows on the map represent the, um, the path that agriculture took to expand um, uh, geogra geographically. And indeed the history of agriculture for several thousands of years has been a history of travels, of exchange uh, of mm, seeds, plants, travel of, of people, and you can say that it is uh, a history of globalization uh, in, in a way. To give you just a few examples of this history, um, one of the most uh, common fruit on the on the planet now, which is apple, everybody eats apple. Uh, it it is um, originating in Kazakhstan, uh, and it travelled from Kazakhstan. It existed only in Kazakhstan and a few regions of China. And it traveled with men, and especially with the horses of men that fed from these very tiny acidic apples. And it, it, uh, it traveled to the west, and now you can find apple uh, in most, uh, most places in, in the world. A bit later on in history, uh, with the Roman Empire uh, in Europe and around Mediterranean, uh, we can see that uh, through the Roman history and when the Roman tr uh, army uh, went north, they brought along with them many fruits that now we consider as uh, endemic in France, uh, apricots, peaches, uh, and so on. And it is really um, the men that bro brought them along with them. And a uh, final example, uh, when in the 19th and 20th century uh, workers came from Russia, from Ukraine, into the USA. They brought with them uh, seeds of wheat that did not exist uh, before in the USA, that were much more adapted to the, the cold climate of the northern states. And it replaced the, the varieties of wheat that were harvested and cultivated uh, there before. And so you can see that Plants travel, they have traveled for thousands of years, and the first form of agricultural globalization were, uh, were just travel of seeds and plants, and it, it was a richness because uh, everywhere in the world you could gain new species, new varieties, uh, and uh, enrich the, the, the agricultural diversity. Um, Agriculture, the, the core of agriculture is domestication. Uh, you can see here a picture of a field of wild cereals, as you can uh, see it today. It's in the north of the Lake of Galilee. And um, it is from uh, a field like that, of wild cereals, that agriculture was born. Uh, so what is this, this process? Um, here if you have um, a community of people living in a place where the human density starts to be to be uh, a, a bit a bit um, high, and at some time you have difficulties to find enough food when you you just live by uh, picking up uh, grains and food, 
you start to develop techniques of uh, selection of wild plants that are very uh, interesting for nutrition. And um, for example, you will start by picking uh, grains on plants that you find uh, very well filled uh, with um, ears with a lot of grains and you will pick those grains, you will try to uh, replant them uh, next year to sow them and, and uh, little by little you modify the, the plants that live in the ecosystem and you obtained uh, from one uh, plant that is here the wild emmer wheat um, that is one of the most ancient cereal you generate a diversity of new species like wheat for example and so in uh, it was a very long process it took uh, several thousands of years to create the, the diversity of cereals that we know uh, now uh, but it's really a human process of selecting things that you think are interesting and by this selection process, you modify the plants and their biology. And the, the, the mechanisms by which you create this diversity, uh, it's called mass selection. It's, it, it looks complicated, it's very simple. And uh, if you see that here you have a field, every dot uh, is a plant, you see that Traditionally, a field is made of a large quantity of plants that are all a bit different from one another. You have here plants in white that are plants that are, haven't grown well, have made very tiny grains, not well filled, that won't be interesting for the people uh, that would feed from them. And you have very dark dots. They represent the plants that are of high interest for people. And so what is agriculture? Traditionally, it's people selecting a few plants in this field and um, sowing them the next year. And you obtain a field that is different from what it was the year before. And uh, it is a bit more, uh, it resembles a bit more uh, of uh, what you would like to obtain, to gain, which is a, a field um, filled with plants uh, that have you know, a lot of, of uh, brown dots in it. What is interesting in this mass selection, which is a, a, a human process, is that you can take two uh, brown dots, they look alike, they have probably very similar characters if you look at them, but genetically they're different. Okay, same character but different genome. And this is uh, what is at the, the heart of the, um, of the adaptation of plants and cultivated plants to their environment. This is what you want to have uh, so that the plants you cultivate can adapt to new climatic conditions, to new pests. Um, this select mass selection process is what uh, makes adaptation possible. To give you um, an example of why it is extremely important, there were researches uh, conducted in Burkina Faso in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, Burkina Faso went uh, through a drought that was one of the worst in its history. It lasted a bit more than 10 years. And a French Research Institute uh, for Development conducted research to know how plants had adapted to this uh, quite extreme uh, condition, dr um, dry conditions. And they found that um, in, uh, for farmers that uh, selected their seeds uh, in this way, that performed mass selection, the plants had adapted <laughs> every year um, by um, farmers picking up the grains that had uh, the most uh, adapted genome to these conditions and they obtained plants that had a different cycle, a different length of cycle that was well adapted to the dry conditions and that was the, there were new conditions. So this selection, mass selection process is extremely important to ensure the adaptation of agriculture to the, the uh, climatic conditions that change. This mass selection lasted for about 12,000 of years, which is the length of agricultural history, and it ended 
in uh, at least in Europe and is in uh, modern countries um, around 1850. So what happened uh, in the 1850s? Um, a few seed houses, commercial seed houses in France, um, decided that they need to expand their activity, their business. And what was a, a process made only by farmers, seed selection, became uh, an activity performed by private companies. And so they tried their best to uh, convince farmers to stop selecting the seeds and producing their own seeds. Uh, to do that, um, it's interesting to notice in the catalogues of this time, you see the, the apparition of a new character, which is a scientist with a white coat, represented here. Uh, it was completely absent uh, before the, the seeds were produced by farmers in the field. Uh, that had been like that for 12,000 12, of years. And now uh, they try to install the idea that to produce good seeds, to produce quality seeds that would give high yields, you need to uh, trust scientists. They have the knowledge, they know how to produce uh, quality seeds. It's a technical process, you really need to trust people and you will gain uh, good yields, which is uh, what all farmers want. And in a very short amount of time, uh, things change. Farmers, most farmers here, stopped to produce their seeds and um, and uh, industries took their place. So, wha what does this change, uh, this, um, this major rupture? Well, the, t the, the nature of the seed selection that you perform in a field, like we, we saw mass selection, is very different from what scientists uh, do in, in, the, in their labs. Um, it's at that time that the, the ideas of Gregor Mendel, who discovered the laws of heredity, have um, begun to be popular and scientists try to develop line of plants. You have probably heard of a line of cells. When you, uh, you do research on cells in a lab, you want to have cells that are very similar from one another, that even are clones, uh, so that they react the same way on, uh, on an, uh, for an, I don't know, an epidemic or an infection or whatever. You want them to be really similar. Well, they did the same thing with plants. The idea behind it is that if you have a good plant uh, that produces well, you want in a field to have uh, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of this plant to have uh, a well-performing field. Uh, it is contrary to what we have seen before, the, the, the what you need to have plants that, that adapt to their environment is to have a, a large heterogeneity inside a field. Well, um, the modern history of seed selection of agriculture is at the opposite. Uh, we, tr we try to develop varieties that were uh, clones, yes, that produce well. The effect of the generalization of, of uh, seed industry is that, of course, the diversity available in the seed market uh, dropped quite quickly. You have here you can see uh, it, it's in, in the USA uh, what the varieties that were available in a commercial seed house in 1903. Uh, you can see, well, the, the numbers are, are a bit uh, small, I read it for you. You had about uh, 540 varieties of cabbage, uh, 500 varieties of lettuce, uh, 400 of peas, etc., etc. And uh, about 80 years later, this is what remains for the different species, the number of variety that remained uh, available in the market. Um, of course, you would say that uh, new varieties have been uh, have been created. That's that's uh, right. And if you read uh, the numbers of new varieties, it's huge. Uh, in France, every year we produce about uh, several hundreds of new varieties of wheat, of tomato. It's huge, but the the diversity in these varieties is practically none. You create a lot of of varieties that look alike, that react alike to the environment, which is very badly, 
uh, they react badly to change in environment. They, they are not uh, designed for that. And inside the variety, you have no, uh, no genetic uh, diversity. So yes, diversity can be poor. And this is a study that has been uh, performed recently on wheat. You can see that you have different uh, ways in which you can, um, you can describe diversity. You can look, uh, as in the, the graph uh, on, on, the, on the top, you can count the varieties that are cultivated. You can see that, indeed, after a, um, a strong diminution in the 50s and 60s, you have a strong increase, which is the, the cr creation of new vari variety uh, by uh, French research and, and French uh, uh, indus seed industries. Now, if you look here in the middle, if you look at an index that um, measure the genetic diversity between these varieties, are they very different from one another? You can see that, actually, no, it's stagnated. They are not uh, more different now than they were at the beginning of the century. And now, if you look at another index which takes into account the diversity between varieties inside the varieties and their repartition in the their um, yeah their repartition in the in the country, you see that it dim it, uh, it dropped really uh, through the century. So now you have a lot of varieties that are look alike that uh, are very homogeneous uh, in terms of, of uh, genetics and. Um, in most areas in the country, you have only a very small number of varieties that are cultivated. And here, I'm sorry, it's not, you cannot see very well, but I will translate it for you. You can see here in 1912 um, that the majority of varieties that were cultivated were what we call land varieties. It is what now we tend to call uh, ancient varieties. It was just the varieties um, created by the mass selection everywhere in the country. It was just um, the, natural, uh, the natural way of selecting seeds. And um, they disappeared. Yeah. In 1950, you had almost no more uh, of, the, of this uh, land varieties. They were replaced by uh, what we called uh, ancient lines that were created by the, the seed industries. Now we tend to consider them as uh, ancient varieties, but uh, they were already um, uh, much more poor in genetic diversity than the, the land uh, varieties that they replaced. Just why did they replace the land varieties? Just because they were more productive. Hmm? They were designed to, to give higher yields. That's where they were um, well adopted by uh, by peasants, and then quite rapidly you see the apparition of the of the green here, which is the modern uh, lines. We call it pure lines. They are uh, what you can find of more homogeneous in terms of genetics. It is very high yielding. Um, it needs a lot of fertilizer to achieve the yields, um, and now. It is 99.9% uh, of what you can find uh, in a field in France. So yes, you can create uh, poor biodiversity. Mm. That's important to, to remember. A few words on the official catalog, because um, you will see that biodiversity is um, very, um, how to say that? Um, it is uh, well registered in, in, uh, in catalogs, and this is quite new. It was created only in 1932. Before that, uh, well, you could create your variety in uh, your field, and um, nobody would notice it exists. It was just, you know, you use it, and it adapts, and it evolves, and uh, it changes it to something else. In 1932, we want to know what is cultivated in the country, uh, what's the name? So it's a, a huge, um, a huge work. Uh, you began by um, by uh, 
systematically registering the new varieties that are created by the, the research lab, the industries. And then, uh, in 1949, you decide, it's a decree from the government, that only the seeds that are obtained from varieties registered in the catalogue that can be sold on the market. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, I don't know uh, how much it costed uh, back in the 1950s, but now to, to register a variety, it costs between 4,000 and 10,000 euros. You need, uh, so you pay once, then you need to pay every year to maintain the variety on the catalog. And every 10 years, you need to uh, pay again uh, if the variety um, can stay in the catalog. And in the 1960s, and that's very uh, important, it's a major rupture, you uh, decide to exclude the varieties if they do not meet the new criteria. And this cr criteria, it's three criteria, distinction, stability and homogeneity. It means that a new a variety that is inscribed to the catalogue must be distinct from the varieties that are already registered. It must be stable, which is if you plant them uh, two years, you need to obtain exactly the same plant uh, on the two years, which is um, unnatural, you would say, uh, if you remember what a mass selection was. And they need to be homogeneous. You don't want uh, diversity inside a plant population. There must be clones. So there's three criteria. They exclude absolutely the possibility of registering um, uh, land varieties completely. So you, you obtain a catalogue that is only filled with modern varieties uh, that have absolutely no possibility of adaptation to new climatic conditions, to new pests, to the change that happen obviously in the environment. And um, because there was a bit of protestation uh, from the association that uh, want to defend and protect biodiversity, uh, they decided to create a list for the ancient varieties, um, which is only for amateurs. You do not, uh, uh, you, you cannot, if you're a farmer, professional, you cannot buy uh, the seeds, it's, uh, it's against the law. It is only uh, last year, in 2016, um, that the law uh, authorized the exchange of non-registered seeds, which uh, are am among, uh, among them are the, the land varieties, between the farmers. So the, the se selling the seeds is still, uh, is still against the law, at least if you want to sell them to professionals, but now you have the right to exchange them uh, between farmers. The problem is to have access to the seeds if you cannot buy them, because uh, they are very um, confidential for the time. But you can uh, buy them if you are an amateur and you want to grow them in your garden, now you can do it. It's very, very recent, it was last year. Um, it's uh, interesting to notice that many farmers have adopted the modern varieties. They didn't have much choice when it became uh, what was uh, available on the market. But uh, they kept the habit to uh, produce their own seeds. So they bought modern variety and they uh, kept the, you know, the habit of, uh, of, um, of um, collecting the seeds and planting them again the next year. And so the, the industry uh, found a, a large mist win here and they decided to create uh, in seven 1975 what is called, I say it in French, I will translate it, a contribution volontaire obligatoire, which is a very nice word to say. It's a mandatory but voluntary contribution. So you need to pay uh, to produce your own seeds because you know, you're not buying the seeds, so, um, and you should, yes. And, of course, uh, industry would tell you that it is very, very important to maintain the biodiversity, conserve it, protect it, because it has a uh, high value. And they participate financially to the construction and the management of this World Seed Banks. And I'm sure you have heard all of the seed vault of Sp Svalbard, which is on the island of Spitsberg that belongs to the Norway Norwegia. 
It's managed by the Global Crop Diversity Trust, which, which is financed by many, many seed industries, but not only seed industries. And um, it contains, at the time, uh, more than 500,000 samples of plants, of seeds. Uh, it can, uh, in the long term, it will probably reach 4.5 million of samples. And its target is to, um, to conserve the, the seeds of, of all edible plants uh, available on the planet. Um, there is another project, uh, which is the Millenium, Millennium Seed Bank project in the Sussex, in the um, United Kingdom. And it's a, a similar project, but um, it focuses more on the endangered plants, plants from very uh, um, dry regions that could disappear, etc., and on the most useful plants. Uh, including those that are um, uh, valuable for ecological engineering, um, removing po pollution from soils, uh, etc., etc. And so its target is to have in 2020 25% of the known wild plants. So if you remember what I said at the beginning uh, on the, the mass selection and the fact that it is only this way that you can ensure that the plants adapt to their environment, um, here you can, and I, I ask you the question, what is the value of uh, a seed that would stay in a seed vault in Svalbard for about two, let's say 200 years, it's not much. Uh, what good is it if it hasn't evolved with the environment? Where would you uh, plant it and what would it give? Probably not what it was when you put it uh, in, the, in the vault uh, in the first place. So, um, people thought of that, huh? uh, they, they are not naive, they know that you lose the, the quality of the seeds and, uh, and their interest when you, when you store them for such a long period of time um, outside of their, of their environment. But what I think, and this is what most people uh, agree to say, what is interesting for the Global Crop Diversity Trust is that you just have access to the seeds and so you can sequence it and get the genome and create after new varieties. You have the genes, you know what genes produce uh, what, uh, what uh, character and then you can do uh, engineering on seeds and cre create varieties like that and you have gained um, the gene sequence of all plants uh, on the earth uh, quite, uh, quite easily. So today you have a clear, um, a clear um, frontier between conservation and production. Uh, most people uh, believe that you know it doesn't have to, to um, it's two separate processes, and you can do production. Uh, I will give you an, a, a very um, good example. It's apple. In France, uh, you have, in all regions of France, you have uh, conservatory orchards, uh, associations that promote the, the diversity of apples, but you have the same thing for cherries, for pears, for carrots, for wh every, uh, what you want. And um, here is, uh, in Haute-Normandie, you have seven, uh, 725 varieties of apple trees uh, registered. They are in real orchards, they are conserved in, in their environment. Uh, you have apples for uh, table, for eating, you have apples for cider, for flowers, and everything you want. In the same time, in France in 2017, just last year, three varieties, which are Golden, Granny Smith and Gala, accounted for more than 60% of the production. Uh, it's the same in most um, European countries and in the US. Um, the What makes the... Um, the, the commercial production is very poor in diversity. While you have all this diversity available um, uh, in the uh, in the in the country, so the question that you can ask is: um, Are commercial requirements compatible with the conservation of, of diversity of uh, agricultural diversity? And um, I do here a quick recap on 
why does diversity dramatically drop when um, you need to um, when you you start to see agriculture as a, a productive sector you know a sector that needs to be highly productive and with um, with uh, long commercial circuits etc the first step is you set high production goals now um, most professional need to uh, to achieve uh, high yields to live mm? and so uh, it was the case uh, in France. It was the case after the Second World War. Uh, we try. We we needed to produce a bit more to compensate the fact that most workers were not available anymore in the fields. So you set high production goals and you give uh, like technical tools to uh, to uh, achieve these goals. Uh, it was mostly fertilizer um, mechanization. And when you do that, you lose uh, a lot of varieties that I call unfitted to modern agriculture. Here, um, on the picture that you do not see well, uh, it's a, a field of wheat, um, of land wheat, an ancient variety. And they were very, very common in the country, in France, in the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, they disappeared in the 50s because they're, they do not tolerate fertilizer. If you put nitrogen in the soil, which uh, everybody did uh, to, to increase the yields, uh, the sweet uh, just die. You know? uh, they fall on the ground and you cannot do anything with them. They are only adapted to natural soil, I would say, that are not uh, complemented in nitrogen. So when you start to, uh, to distribute nitrogen to all farmers, well, you need to give them the modern varieties that are adapted to this new, um, this new um, uh, cultural techniques. So this is the first phase of div diversity loss. And then the second phase is uh, linked to the development of long commercial circuits not only because people live more and more in the urban environment, but also because you want to develop new markets. It was the case in France in the 50s. Um, you need to, to, to really remember that the increase in production that was needed after the Second World War, um, it was obtained very quickly. And in the mid 50s, we had uh, achieved the, the production goals that were needed for self-sufficiency. And then um, uh, the French government decided to um, develop new markets, uh, uh, the, you know, foreign markets, uh, just to, to sell the, the overproduction, uh, the production in excess uh, in most production. And then it became just a, a way to, um, to increase the salary of, of workers. Um, to develop new markets. And so this creates the second phase, phase of diversity loss because a lot of varieties are just unfitted to whether transport, storage, uh, refrigeration, calibration for selling in supermarkets, etc. I will give you uh, two examples of that. You have here um, the example of the apple, the apple. Uh, we talked um, a bit earlier about the Granny Smith. It is just here. It is very shiny. Um, you can have uh, orchards that produce uh, s fruits that have the same size, which is very good for um, selling in supermarkets. And then you have an ancient variety that is quite ugly <laughs> for many people and that would never uh, be sold in a supermarket today. So most varieties are just um, are no longer cultivated because of that. They cannot be sold in what becomes the most uh, available um, uh, commercial circuits. And then on the right you can see two types of bread or you cannot see two types of bread but uh, it's just to show you that um, with the modernity uh, modernization of of, uh, of agricultural industry, um, the the techniques uh, in bakery, for example, changed very deeply, and most um, most varieties of wheat were just not adapted anymore to to the techniques used, to the very quick fermentation, to the use of of yeast, uh, of chemical yeasts, etc. And so 
it's the second phase you start to cultivate varieties that are just unfitted to um, to the modern uh, industry so just to to finish off, I would uh, like to read you two short texts, and I think it will be a good introduction to the, the presentation of your colleagues. Uh, it's two texts that come from the, the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of, uh, of the UN. The first one was written in 1977. Uh, I read it to you. The genetic resources of the plants by which we live are dwindling rapidly and disastrously. As developments proceed in the less advanced as in the more advanced areas of the world, the reserves of genetic variation stored in the primitive crop varieties, which had been cultivated over hundreds of thousands of years, have been or are being displaced by high producing and uniform cultivars and by forest plantation. What is inevitable and essential progress in one direction is a calamitous deprivation in another. For the developing countries, as much as for the developed ones, plant breeding and plant introduction, perhaps the most powerful single weapon of agricultural improvement, are rapidly being deprived of the very raw materials upon which they depend. This erosion, erosion of our biological resources may gravely affect future generations, which will rightly blame ours for lack of responsibility and foresight. So that was written in 1967 and I think it's a good, um, uh, it's a good recap on of w why we need uh, this, uh, this agricultural diversity. And it's interesting to see in another report that was published by uh, the very same organization only nine years before that, in most countries, an excessively large number of rice varieties are still cultivated. To raise the average yield, it is important to eliminate the less productive ones. Only a limited number of modern varieties need to be included in the seed distribution programs of the FAO. So that was nine years before, and it shows that um, just the, the, the green revolution that happened uh, in, uh, in Asia, in, uh, in South America, they have created a huge damage that even now we do not, we do not know uh, how to fix. Um, and perhaps you will, you will talk a bit more about this in your presentation. And I thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Lea Lugasi, for your presentation. It was, was really insightful. Uh, what I will do here, I will be introducing our topic by giving you uh, the highlights and takeaways from the paper sent to us by Lea Lugasi. Um, it's David Ehrenfeld's paper, The Environmental Limits to Globalization. And then Luca will give you a more uh, detailed discussion about the topic. <coughs> so, can go on slide one. So on Ehrenfeld's paper, he points out that we can easily spot the usually the most common attacks on globalization has always been related to either social or economic terms. Usually focusing on the rich versus the poor, the exploiter versus the exploited, and it's always the same discussion. So he invites us on his paper to look at the non-political side of, of this particular uh, conflict, which is the impact of the, envirom the environment uh, caused by globalization. So David, he points out that environmental and social effects are highly uh, correlated and they should urgently receive more attention from the general public. His main question is, at what point countries uh, such as China and, and India are going to be able to maintain their, their supply of cheap labor without growing a threat of potential popular uprises and rebellions to their national stability? And at the same time, if we take into account that these conditions can, can actually take place, what will happen to the massive demand coming from industrialized uh, nations 
of these particular goods, which are now remaining in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Slide two. So, Ehrenfeld mentions that the catastrophic short-term uh, effects adding up to, to the scenario that I've just described can be considered a, a perfect setup for environmental and, and social chaos. Um, moreover, the, the disappearance of part particularly cheap energy and fresh water is actually killing agricultural local communities and vanishing with genetic diversity of crops and, and farm animals. Basically, what, what David is saying that is that globalization is rapidly creating an environment that will prove itself lethal to its own survival. An interesting um, point made by him during his paper is that the usual discussion is always about you know, the positive and the negative effects of globalization, such as now we can have the poorest citizens of the poorest countries now having access or being able to enjoy a, a decent uh, source of income, while on the other hand, you have the other group talking about the negative, um, the negative effects as, as the ever-growing gap between rich and poor, and also the, the, the harmful uh, effects of globalization, on, particularly on local communities. But as he mentions, this discussion is a, is a total distraction. If we only focus on economic and social terms, if there is nothing left to build on. So basically, he's trying to, to say that environmental effects of, of globalization should not and cannot be measured by, measured by numbers, GDP, unemployment rate, or any of these, these particular, um, particular terms. So we have, basically, we have to set those aside and come up, and by setting those aside, we can still come up with strong argument and solid arguments about the impact of globalization on biodiversity. So here, Ehrenfeld sees that the reduction of um, genetic and cultural biodiversity is, is one, if not the most harmful effect of, of globalization, as he strongly connects this particular a phenomena to the petrochemical and pharmaceutical corporations now having access and and basically targeting a areas which were previously isolated from the global market from from global uh, from globalized agriculture so with that happening we hoping for for a higher um productivity and higher growth, uh, these farmers are now dropping their traditional crop varieties and adopting these new types of high yielding chemicals, uh, chemical patented seeds, which are tremendously dependent on massive amounts of pesticides and, and fertilizers. Um, a brief example of this, this um, predatory, as we can, we can call predatory behavior of these, these companies, is the one about Monsanto in Brazil. This company got caught uh, applying what we can call abusive business practices by, they were basically requiring uh, local producers of uh, having a minimum of 85% of their crops using their chemical patented seeds in order to have access or in order to purchase their, their um, traditional line or their natural seeds. They were sued and they had to pay an enormous amount in terms of uh, compensation fees. So back to Ehrenfeld, um, he mentions in his paper another good example of this, uh, this takeover of chemical patented seeds uh, his example is the one given by the, the Indian agriculture scientist, Dr. Hanumapa Sudarshan, who is the founder of Karuna Trust, 
which is a particular uh, organization involved with uh, integrated rural uh, development. Uh, Dr. Sudarshan shows in a study that over the last, over the last um, century, India was, was capable of growing around 30,000 different uh, varieties of, of rice. But now, if we take into account only the, the last 20 years, the situation has been changing at a rapid, rapid pace. And if things keep on going like the way they are, India uh, will soon be reduced from 30,000 to only 50 varieties of rice, having the top 10 accounting for over three quarters of the continent's uh, rice crops. Now I'll pass it on to Luca, and he's going to talk uh, about the economic of seeds and its development. <clears throat> All right, I hope you don't mind me standing up. All right. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Lugasi already uh, mentioned about the point of uh, land varieties, it actually can happen that um, people or like um, uh, farmers actually do illegal practice by um, cultivating land varieties and using their own seeds. And the second paper we were writing about was actually about that, about such farmers who are like illegal. So actually what I wanted to do is like look a bit closely at what seeds actually are to understand better how that can happen. And um, uh, if we see like seeds are actually not just seeds. On the one side they have a huge symbolic, uh, symbolic value, like um, uh, it's a sign for life and also like in the Bible be the seed of the world and so actually they have a huge value also in the culture of uh, of people. On the other side, they have a really, for agriculture, have a really um, stretch, strategic role for, agri for agriculture. Because as we saw, if we have this um, mass selection of uh, land, uh, um, land vari varieties, they actually were adapting to the agricultural, economical and social environment they were, and ecological environment, of course. However, if you can control the seeds, on the other side, you also control the way agriculture um, is organized. And um, actually, and then what I was thinking of, like thinking seeds in the seed market from an economic perspective, actually what I could saw is kind of a, um, um, of a commodification as um, Polanyi was describing in the case of fictitious commodities. And um, because actually what is, uh, um, what is happening in the um, case of commodification is first the uh, normalization and the privatization. And what we had in the case of, uh, of seeds was first what we already heard in those official um, leaflets or books that actually there was an uh, um, uh, um, unambitious measure and the technical process of codification was uh, created and um, actually also a uh, scientific standardization that started with colonization when new seeds were imported. So people had to um, understand those seeds and what are the difference between different vi varieties. However, in those times back, it was still like the trade of the physical seed. Um, the second step to um, commodify seeds and especially varieties, more varieties than seeds, um, is actually the privatization of varieties, which was mainly um, possible through property rights. The property rights of breeders, the breeder's right, um, which actually changed from a farmer's right to use their own seeds and to reuse their own seeds to a breeder's right to later than even the patenting of, uh, of varieties. And um, this um, this movement to privatization of varieties um, became even stronger and stronger um, because in the beginning when it was actually the right of the farmer to re reuse their own seeds um, in, in 1961 with the UPOF, the International Union for Protection of New Varieties uh, of Plants, there was actually the breeder's right introduced which is actually giving the breeder a monopoly of 20 to 30 years where um, others cannot use where their seeds or new varieties are protected. Um, in that case, we still have the, um, uh, the um, farmer's privilege, 
that actually the farmer under certain conditions um, can use, reuse their own seeds. However, if you already see it's a um, breeder's right and farmer privilege, so we see where it's going. Um, and then the second, even more restrictive uh, um, move in that direction of uh, prioritization is the patenting of varieties, which was like starting with the Plant Patent Act in the 1930s and even later with the Chakravetti ruling um, you could even uh, patent life forms, so you could even like patent the very the, um, genetic basis of varieties. Um, so, and in the case of patents you don't even have the um, farmer's privilege anymore. Um, and this whole prioritization um, uh, led to the point that today 10 companies account for 55% of the global seed markets. And actually that, is, that are the numbers that were most, um, most low, like there are even uh, um, numbers that uh, say there are like kind of three uh, companies uh, um, controlling half of the market. Um, and there's one case in the, in the developing countries, because actually there it has a really big impact. Um, and I took as an example the Comises, the common market for Eastern and Southern, uh, Southern Africa, which is a free trade area of 20 countries from Liberia to um, uh, Swaziland. And um, what is actually uh, written in this, uh, in this agreement is that all member countries must abide common sea trade regulation which were drafted in 2013 and until last year they were um, all adopted by, by all member, uh, member states. And if we look at Africa or at the African com uh, continent, um, it's still that the farmers seed still make out 80 to 90 percent. So on the one side it might be a huge diversity, on the other side it's a huge market, um, a huge potential market for breeders. Um, so um, Actually, there are a lot of uh, um, interest groups that are uh, helping the um, Comesa in uh, creating a market for seeds, for more um, productive um, agricultural production. And actually, um, if you certificate a seed in one country in the Comesa, it's already uh, also the um, it's applied to the whole um, free trade zone. Um, so the overall goal is actually to create a, a regional seed market. So there's also already a normalization taking place. Um, there's a catalog um, introduced um, according to the EPOF criteria. So they have to be distinct, uniform and stable. And of course, most of the land uh, varieties, they're not stable because it's always a natural process. So actually most of them are already uh, excluded. Um, on the other side, um, there, there's a um, policy on MGOs um, written in the, in the contract, which um, oblige member states to um, accept the VTO trip, trips agreement. And um, um, exactly, and actually, there are um, biosecurity laws, which kind, of, which are supposed to make GMO more secure. But on the other side, of course, if you have security laws, it's like the precondition of GMO to enter the market. Um, so there is, however, some resistance, maybe ways out of uh, the situation. Um, there are a lot of local seed networks, um, seed banks, seed commons, and national and local resistance against this um, commodification of seeds. And all, um, however, globally, there's uh, um, it's hard to see to return that um, 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 that direction actually see the commodification of seeds is, uh, is taken and where we see it really dramatically was there was in 18, uh, 1983 there was the international undertaking of plant genetic resources which were actually saying that seeds or varieties are uh, a common heritage and should be um, protected. However, um, a lot of comments said um, actually this uh, um, this was not even the worth the paper was written on. Um, so, uh, so now we will have three questions for you. Um, the first one is, is there a way back to the seed commons under the current development, develop, development system? Second one, is the global hunger a problem of productivity or 
productivity gap between developed and developing countries and what does this mean for agricultural policy. And the third and last one is, besides offering high productivity and faster uh, growth, deals involving chemical patent and seeds come also with fu financing and funding benefits in the form of low interest loans. In your opinion, what will be the government role in terms of reversing this particular trend? And that will be it, and here are our references. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice presentation, the very in interesting questions that are complex. Um, so on, on the first one, the, the way back. Um, yeah, I would say that it does exist uh, in theory, uh, no doubt. We have a few examples. Um, I have one in mind uh, in France where 100% um, of maize varieties uh, available on the market are modern hybrids uh, necessitating huge amounts of water. Uh, one farmer, just one guy, uh, decided to uh, just go in the big world and find varieties that he could use uh, that had disappeared in France. They were cultivated in the 19th century in the southwest part of the, of the country. They had disappeared in the 20th century and he went back in Central America to try and get uh, ancient varieties and readapt them. Uh, those are varieties that had still the, the adaptation power, you know, uh, they were heterogeneous, they could um, adapt gradually and now uh, this guy just every summer uh, he does one uh, one day on his farm where all farmers that want uh, seeds from from these varieties can come and get seeds it's um, it's a, a private uh, uh, wheel yes it's it but uh, it's um you know if you have a few a few person like that in a country, you can create a tiny uh, embryo of of, uh, of the way back. But I would say the main uh, the main problem here is that um, if you are a farmer that need to sell his production to um, an industry, which is the case of most farmers, whether they cultivate maize or wheat or uh, uh, beetroot or whatever. Um, if you want to sell your production, you need to grow certain varieties. There are always modern varieties, whether because uh, it's only with these varieties that you can do the industrial process that you need to do, or because there is an agreement between uh, industry and some of them are very, very linked. Um, so I would say it really depends of whether you are involved in this industrial process or whether you are involved in um, exportation for most uh, in most developed countries if you want to export uh, your production uh, you need to have th the varieties that will be uh, accepted by the country that will import uh, your production so it is not that simple uh, I would say that if you want to um, really go back to the ancient variety in a large scale you need to change the frame and the commercial frame in which farmers um, evolve. Uh, that's the first thing. And you need to change the law because you, you mentioned it. In, in most countries now, you have laws uh, that criminalize uh, farmers' seeds and farmers that uh, use them. Uh, it's not the case in France since last year. So it's very, you know, the way back is very, very recent and it is still um, quite timid. I would say because of the strength of the of the lobby of the city industry. Um, global hunger. Um, I'll read the question again. Yeah, well, for me, um, global hunger is not a problem of productivity. Um, 
Yes, you, you usually hear, hear that um, people that suffer the most from hunger are farmers. Uh, it is true, but uh, we must not uh, forget that um, most of these farmers uh, are not, um, do not own their land. They are uh, land workers and they do not have um, uh, the... Um, yeah, they need to sell their production to live. You know, we are we have left the self-sufficiency farms in uh, uh, completely autosufficient uh, since quite a long time now. And um, so, I would say it's not a problem of productivity. Um, and in terms of agricultural policy, for me, um, changing this, yeah. Resolving this problem for me is again um, how would farmer um, how to say that um, do they need to sell commercial production to live or not? Um, we see sometimes that uh, as a, as a farmer you live better if you need to sell only a small pr part of your production that is uh, with a higher commercial value uh, than if you need to uh, sell just uh, uh, primary products, just rice or just uh, whatever. Uh, so I would say that a good agricultural policy would have um, an ambitious policy on, uh, on self-sufficiency for me, it's uh, in many countries. It would help to resolve the hunger problem, uh, the access to land, which is the major problem in many countries uh, facing hunger problems, and uh, and we we cannot uh, den deny the fact that yes, some land varieties are not uh, very productive, but there is uh, there is work that can be done to adapt them uh, better to the conditions. And you have a lot of, uh, of uh, small irrigation uh, work that can be done to, you know, to increase uh, uh, yields where there is a need to increase, but without um, just uh, wanting to, to follow the, the path that we have followed, which is modern varieties, high input, uh, uh, fertilizer, etc. I believe, yes, strongly that there is another way um, and for me, agricultural policies should uh, go that way, yeah, more than the, the green revolution all over again. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, for the third question, with which is a very complex one, and it, yes, it is, um, it is the fight of uh, of uh, gigantic uh, financial interests, which are uh, Monsanto and Syngenta, etc., um, that just makes their laws. Uh, you you said, um, I don't know, how did you say, abusive business practices? That that's what it is. Yeah. And uh, and some of them are illegal. In uh, uh, Monsanto has been um, has been um, uh, taken injustice in India for uh, false publicity on on its seed, and it it paid. Uh, uh, no, yeah, the yeah, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know they do not stop <laughs> because they have uh, they have the money to pay and uh, and the the amount of money to win uh, in these countries is enormous. Uh, for the case of Brazil. Um, I would say that the main problem, once again, is the economic frame. Uh, most farmers in Brazil um, live because of soy. Uh, Brazil has made of soy uh, a very um, big market. They export a lot of soy. In France, we import from Brazil uh, most of our soy, Brazil and, uh, and the US. Uh, and beef also, which is... Uh, which. Uh, it's the soy produced in Brazil. Uh, yes, if you, 
as a government, you decide that uh, you, you want to base your, uh, your uh, agricultural economy on the exportation, the production of uh, soy and maize. Uh, well, wha what interest would you have to, um, you know, to, to fight Monsanto? You do not have uh, any interest to do that. So, um, uh, yes, once again, for me, now, um, the, the way back is to focus more on the inter interior market, national markets, uh, and to rely less on the, on the exportations that, you know, force you to, to collaborate with the, usually with the, the large uh, seed industries. Mm. And yes, if I can just add one, because um, I thought of something that is quite interesting and it's happening just now. Uh, China, uh, who has uh, exported a large amount of rice ever in Africa and, and the rest of Asia and Europe, now uh, starts to, um, to cultivate again high quality, low yielding rice for its upper class which you know, request uh, good rice, they do not satisfy of the rice that is produced, uh, that was uh, destined for exportation. And now it starts to really, really, uh, and not only for rice, but for many production, to, um, to fill the request of its upper class that has uh, you know, high quality uh, needs. And it's oh, so it concerns only a small amount of the production, but it's you know, uh, an interesting phenomenon to, to look at now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I would like now to open the um, floor for questions. Um, if you don't mind, I would maybe select uh, two or three questions and then we can um, answer them together. Um, I would just go from right to left. Um, please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Benedict. I'm from Germany and for Mark, I'm in option B, so you can find me. Um, I have essentially two questions uh, as kind of the Regarding the possibility for leverage for positive development, so number one, uh, when I was I, I did an internship at UNIDO, and my impression was there that the this kind of perspective of agroecology is actually gaining a little bit of uh, traction at least, um, but I, I have only limited knowledge. So my question is, was that like a, a correct impression, or is that was that just dreaming? Uh, and second question, for this part of the world, so the developed world, um, I see a lot of kind of direct marketing opportunities popping up, Les, les Alles Alimentaires in, in Paris, for example. Um, what's your view on that? Is that a trend that could potentially uh, connect farmers to customers and then allow them to, to grow um, diverse seeds? Thank you. Hello, my name is Victoria, I'm from Option A. Um, I would like to ask you to expand a bit more on um, Matsanta case and um, to explain the um, how eligible it is to patent um, gen-modified products. As far as I'm concerned, um, what Monsanto did is actually they uh, patented and asked for royalties from farmers in India um, on these gen-modified products. What kind of regulation exists in the patentability of seeds? Uh, because why this mm, question is crucial is um, that this company is controlling the life not only farmers but also their families and we see a lot of surveys uh, proving that this is idle rates of these farm is farmers is increasing, constantly increasing in different areas. So I would like to um, know your view on that. Thank you. You want to answer those or we will take one more? Uh, Which one? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so the first case question was on agroecology. Yes, I don't think that you 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 had a dream. Uh, I believe it is becoming. Um, I don't think it's a fashion, but uh, you know, people are interested in it. Uh, a few organization like the FAO uh, starts to see it as a way of development for countries. In my opinion, the problem is that 
yeah, the FAO uh, starts to 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 have a, a good reflection on that. Uh, in the meantime, um, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, they continue to have development programs that are um, not at all uh, oriented uh, towards agroecology. And you have now, yes, a uh, very divergent um, way of seeing uh, possible development paths. And uh, I would guess that the, <laughs> the amount of money uh, represented by the, the funds of uh, the World Bank, etc., are still driving, uh, you know, most programs uh, of development. Um, so, I don't know. Perhaps in ten or twenty years, the World Bank will have uh, uh, will have adopted the the view of FAO. But I'm not sure <laughs> of that. Uh, as to the the second part of the question on the connect new collect connection between farmers uh, to customers, etc., uh, it is true that you see uh, in um, in big cities, there is a movement. Uh, uh, the conscience are um, are moving. Uh, we had uh, just last year uh, in the in September October, uh, the big supermarkets Carrefour uh, launched an operation, marketing operation on um, on they called the Forbidden Market. They sold in a few supermarkets in France uh, vegetable from land uh, varieties that are not on the catalog that shouldn't be sold in in supermarkets um it is yes it is a, a marketing operation but it has a good uh, good sides to it because most people do not know that those varieties uh, are um, are unauthorized by law. Uh, they have never tasted them. They don't know what is the difference between the varieties. Uh, uh, they don't know that they're mm, much better to taste, uh, in my opinion. And so it's um, it's it stays at very very small scale. It uh, it's only a few farmers in France and. Uh, uh, you know, most people don't have the the finance to to buy the the vegetable and fruits that have that are uh, more exp expensive than than the 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 modern varieties. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's perhaps the beginning of something. Um, if it does not stay in this you know uh, niche, I don't know how to say. <laughs> Um, for Monsanto, which is a very very complex question, and I, I'm not a specialist of Monsanto, but uh, you you talk about the case of India. Um, India, I think, is a bit special because the Indian government has now uh, really um, taken the uh, seized the importance of the of the problem uh, with a bit of delay. Uh, we have seen the problems caused by Monsanto uh, since um, a few years now, maybe even ten years, a bit more, and the suicidal rates. Uh, Huge link to just the the depth, the the yeah the depth uh, contracted by the the farmers to to buy the seeds. There here uh, in this country, the um, the strategy of Monsanto was clearly uh, illegal. They uh, for a few years they is they gave the seeds or uh, they sold the seeds at a very, very low price with uh, their fertilizer and, uh, and the, the roundup that, um, that uh, was needed. And then uh, after a few years, when farmers are really dependent on their seed because they do not have uh, their seed stocks in their barn anymore, um, and they have you know, changed their, their way to, to cultivate, uh, then the price raised the price of the seeds. And um, I do not know exactly how the Indian government regulates this. I do know that uh, there was a project of Monsanto um, on eggplants and on uh, GMO eggplants, which is uh, it's a major crop uh, in, uh, in India. And the government, um, and this project failed um, because, of a, because of a large uh, protestation uh, from farmer organization. And I do not know the, the implication of the government in it, but I, I know that in India, uh, Monsanto is not in a very good position right now. Um, yeah, 
as for the really the government uh, implication and the regulation, the laws to uh, uh, to um, yeah to prevent Monsanto from just uh, um, killing all uh, farmers, uh, I, I do not know in detail, but. Um, Perhaps you could. I, I, I know. I believe it. It was in the the paper I sent you uh, from the from the Via Campesina, which is the the farmers organization um, international. You you will probably find in this um, paper good information on that, if you want. Yeah, well, y there is no. Um, it is. Uh, it is possible to to say that uh, a, s uh, a plant genome in which you have just added a gene from a different plant uh, is your property. You have the right uh, in uh, international treaties. It is uh, possible. There is an international uh, property treaties in the World Trade Organization. The TRIPS. Uh, you mentioned it. Uh, so yes, it's not um, e even uh, when it's not GMO in France. Most modern varieties are just um, a variety that you have um, uh, crossed with another another variety. Uh, everybody can do it in a lab, uh, but it is the property of the seed company that has uh, created it. So yes, there is no. Uh, I don't know of any country where you cannot. Uh, well, there is no law on uh, intellectual property. It applies to seeds, which is, of course, a huge problem, but um, it is now in the whole world. Yeah. Mm. Any more questions? I think you were first. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Maria Matalla. Um, I'm from Egypt and um, <laughs> Egypt is the biggest uh, importer of wheat in the whole world. And uh, wheat is actually considered as a strategic... Uh, so we, we measure our safety of uh, financial reserves in terms of imports of wheat. <laughs> and um, I just want to ask... A, um, general question about um, the varieties or the potential of varieties that could be domestically developed in uh, developing countries. Um, I don't know, do, do normally uh, they have also to conform with international agreements or this is simply, at least for domestic consumption, if, if we do not consider for exportation or something, but um, do they still have to conform with the international agreements and if not, what could be the risks and also the technical risks for, for developing these uh, varieties uh, in terms of their viability in the future, which is, you also mentioned, for example, the climate change and perhaps some uh, in the future, the, <laughs> the seeds or the some varieties will not be uh, viable in the future, will not be relevant. So um, what would be the case for, for, the, for varieties developed in domestic countries? Thank you. Sorry, in the developing countries. Hi, my name is Maria Mohammed. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very insightful. I belong to Pakistan and we are like one of the most agricultural countries in the world. Um, as you talked about the case of India, uh, I, I just wanted to mention something like earlier um, in India in India and Pakistan being uh, agriculture being one of the largest sector of the economy. We produced a lot of um, crops that were actually surplus in the economy and that could actually meet all the demands of the economy in terms of food and staple. Uh, but later on, when there were a lot of organizations coming uh, through the aid programs into India and Pakistan and trying to transform the uh, agricultural sector in a way 
making it more technical and industrialized doing so they actually created a lot of pesticides and introduced the organic version of wheat or staple that we were producing and converted into a very uh, inorganic sort of uh, staple that was produced in the economy and giving it a economical shape actually and the farmers these days are committing a lot of suicides due to that but uh, uh, because they have a very controversial debate on it like for one side they actually actually talk about increasing the uh, economical benefits and on the other hand they talk about uh, climate change and economic um, environment uh, and preserving the environment and it's very controversial i don't know how can like an uneducated farmer who knows nothing about the wheat, uh, wheat that he's producing can actually think about climate change in these terms like you are you yourself are bringing these uh, seeds into the economy and then uh, then you are talking about climate change in pesticides have became the part of water that is used in the agricultural sector in india and pakistan so it's kind of a very controversial thing that um, actually these organizations coming from abroad are talking about so i want you like to just tell like something about it like how can this problem be tackled you want to take one more or Um, hi, I'm Jelena from Option A and I come from Serbia. Um, so I read uh, one publication that was mentioning the about the GMO seeds, that was mentioning this um, nice uh, idea of that we now eat strawberries with fish gene. So uh, I read the, the biggest um, uh, argument for using those, uh, that scientists use those things to make varieties, is that it's um, the same process that natural selection that you were mentioning would do. For instance, if we take this strawberry and slowly move it through time towards Russia, the, um, the strawberry would develop the resistance on cold. So that's why we are just doing this process faster. So I wasn't really convinced about this, so I just wanted to ask uh, your opinion on it. Thank you. Okay, I'll start with the, the last question. Uh, indeed, it's, um, it's an argument that is very often used uh, that this um, creation of GMO varieties or only just a natural process, but going faster than nature would, and that's not a big deal. Um, yeah, I would well introducing um, genes from another species than strawberry in a strawberry is not a natural process. We we can agree on on this. I would say that um, just uh, going a bit uh, faster than nature. Uh, and creating new varieties that are adapted to new climates, to dry uh, conditions, uh, etc., are not a problem for me. What is a problem is the fact that they uh, are very costly, that they need to be uh, bought every year, that they bind by a very uh, rigid contract uh, the farmers that would buy them, um, and then uh, they contaminate the environment and generating. Um, you know, financial disaster for many farmers that are contaminated. For me, uh, GMOs are not only an ethical problem or is uh, the process that you are doing natural or unnatural. It is the global package, uh, the, the entire package of, uh, you know, of, uh, of contracts that really bind uh, farmers to, um, uh, to these companies and most of them uh, lose uh, in, in the end because they, they lose money and they lose uh, yes just their uh, their liberty uh, their freedom uh, as farmers to you know create their seeds and, and and plant them so for me that's the main problem with that um, on the, the question on on Pakistan um, it yeah it is a, a very a very big problem and you mentioned the fact that um, People do not understand. Uh, on one side, they have uh, economical incitation to to adopt uh, this uh, high yielding varieties and this new uh, way of of producing, and on the other side, they have um, 
they have uh, all kinds of arguments on the environment and, uh, and climate and so on. Um, I would say that from what I, I know of India, I, I don't know from for Pakistan, I'm sorry, but for India, what I have uh, observed and um, the fight of, of uh, the leader of the farmer mov movement, which is Vandana Shiva, it was a fight from the inside. Uh, the, the arguments on the, um, on the environmental uh, uh, destruction, etc., did not come from abroad. Uh, the main driver of the, of the rebellion of farmers came from the fact that um, there was a strong um, a uh, strong problem in their health. Uh, there is and the one from their family that works uh, in the fields. That was the first thing in cotton uh, fields. And the second was um, their financial problems that led a lot of farmers to suicide. And this is uh, the two uh, aspects that created the movement in India and the, uh, and the movement of rebellion of the farmers. Uh, the um, ecological problems were very secondary and it was not the reason why farmers tried to find another way and, f and tried to go get out of uh, the, the GMO seeds. Uh, okay, it was really just uh, the seeds uh, condemn us to uh, bad health and uh, financial disaster because we are not master anymore uh, and we cannot uh, just practice agriculture as we have done uh, for the last uh, uh, centuries. So, um, yeah, I would say in all fights uh, it needs to come from the inside and, and never for, for from the outside. Um, and the last question uh, on Egypt. Um, well, Egypt, I must say, is uh, a country which is indeed a bit part special because it needs uh, to import uh, most of uh, the food that is um, that is eaten in Egypt because it has a very very high density of people and uh, the land available for culture is uh, reducing and is now uh, not uh, sufficient enough to to feed uh, Egyptian people so yes of course a few countries need uh, import uh, to, to import food that's not uh, a debate uh, but it is um, the case of only a limited number of, of countries most countries that um, import for example France uh, import uh, wheat in some forms and export wheat in other countries. Uh, we export live animals and we import dead animals. So the the, the commercial uh, <laughs> uh, logic of this is a bit more um, uh, complex than just uh, countries that produce uh, enough export and those that produce uh, not enough imports. Um, so and you. Perhaps you can precise a bit more your question because uh, I'm not sure I, I got it correctly. You were asking me uh, if the varieties that are uh, developed, uh, created in uh, developing countries, um, if there they were um, they could be used for uh, interior uh, domestic consumption. That's I correct. Was just trying to imagine that it's a more positive uh, scenario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if it can be uh, domestically developed, some sort of varieties that are able to, uh, to, be, to, to, to achieve self-sufficiency in, uh, mm -hmm. in a strategic yeah. uh, import policy. And uh, so what are the risks that, that, can, that can be accompanied with this process? Uh, if, if I, as a developing country, develop my own species, but then it also it might, it mm. might face Mm. Um, so yes, if uh, in a country where uh, where the um, the problem is the unavailability of of adapted species or varieties, um, you could absolutely develop uh, varieties that could be adapted to to the conditions. It would probably take a few years to decades. That's for sure, but uh, it is achievable if the if the problem is not just a, um, a limit of of space and of uh, available land. Uh, you can develop uh, varieties that are adapted to dry conditions, 
perhaps not of wheat, it would be a, perhaps a different cereal. But we have uh, in the in the seed banks, we have a lot of varieties that are adapted to uh, to dry conditions. Or um, uh, yeah, uh, you can develop varieties adapted. Uh, the risks, uh, I would say, um, would be or maybe not risk, but the difficulties would be in the commercial agreements that are, uh, you know, uh, that are in, be in between countries. Uh, Egypt has probably uh, commercial agreements because it imports food, but perhaps it exports uh, different things, or it gain, you know, it has an advantage perhaps on an other market. Um, so it is there is always an aspect of uh, geopolitic uh, in this import-export uh, related to the agricultural sector. And perhaps, yes, if you would decide to, um, to concentrate of on your interior production and um, self-sufficiency, you would have to uh, diplomatically you know, rearrange the connections you have with other countries. Uh, it is one of the, uh, yes, one of the problems uh, in in this uh, um, in this topic because um, focusing on the interior market is not uh, very well seen uh, China does it now uh, more and more because uh, you know it is it has the power uh, the economical power to, to do it but most countries uh, would need to be very very cautious <laughs> when uh, attempting to to go this way um, yeah so for me that's the main It's more natural, uh, but I don't know. They call that something. It's kind of like they call it rotten potatoes, but it's basically a more natural version of potatoes. Mm -hmm. But it's in the end, it gets banned from uh, yes. Fish. The, the commercial treaties are very clear on what can be a uh, trade between countries. Uh, the European, uh, the EU has a very clear um, uh, list of, uh, of uh, authorized uh, varieties for importation, etc. It is not always uh, <laughs> good. Uh, uh, the list can be really put in question because uh, uh, it's based on sanitary uh, arguments that are not always uh, justified, but um, yeah. <coughs> so thank you very much. Are there mm. any more questions now? Uh, <coughs> well, maybe uh, a dumb question. I, I just didn't understand why it is criminal to use unauthorized seeds or. O why are there unauthorized seeds in France or elsewhere? And why is it uh, criminal to sell the products coming out from, uh, from these seeds uh, on, uh, on the markets? Is it because it is thought that some of these seeds m might be dangerous? Or? Um, so in Let's talk for France. Um, Carrefour, in its marketing operation, was very, uh, very, uh, uh, very good because yes, it talked about a uh, forbidden market. It is not a forbidden market. The law doesn't forbid a farmer that uh, that uh, grow uh, non-authorized seeds or seeds that are not registered on the official catalog uh, to sell the final product. You can sell the, the potato, but you, can also you cannot sell the seed. And um, the argument in the origin when the catalog was created uh, was that there was a lot of um, um, unproper seeds, seeds that would not germinate uh, correctly. Um, you buy something and you do not really know what it will give. Is it the variety that you, th you think it will give or perhaps it's very different and you cannot sell? So it was to, you know, make things a bit, um, a bit more uh, right. Um, so now on the, is it legal or illegal? It is illegal to sell uh, un uh, s varieties that are not registered on the official catalog to a farmer. 
if uh, if a farmer wants to buy um, those uh, unregistered seeds, they can it he can only find it in uh, little bags of one gram or two grams. They are uh, packaged for amateurs, so you can buy them them as an, as an amateur. But if you are a farmer and then you need one kilo of uh, carrot seeds. Either it will cost you <laughs> all the money you have to buy a thousand package of one gram, or you will spend years and years and years to uh, you know multipl multiplicate them and have enough uh, for your commercial activity. So, um, why is this? Is it illegal? Um, because hmm, I would say because it uh, the law tends to be made by uh, seed industries. In France, uh, and even now, uh, in the last law in 2016, with the pressure of uh, of farmers' union and uh, and associations and groups, um, they, you know, it was a half and half. Yes, okay, now it's legal to tr to exchange them between farmers, uh, but you cannot buy them. So. Most farmers, they do not have access to anyone that has the seeds. You know, it's it, it's very confidential at the time. So it's not a, a big deal for for uh, seed industries because most farmers, even if they wanted to, uh, they couldn't find uh, the seeds. And even if they found them, they couldn't sell them to the cop to the um, uh, cooperative uh, union uh, that buy the production. So for now, you know, it's um, yeah, it, it's not a, a threat to to the industries, uh, but um, yeah, I, I believe in some countries uh, it's really in the law that you need to use certified seeds, uh, and uh, um, clearly it's when the the lobby are uh, powerful enough to you know to to write the law. It exists, but it's not the, the norm. Usually, they they are just very difficult to um, to get, at least in Europe. Uh, it's very different in Africa, where uh, there is a willing to uh, criminalize it in the law, but the resistance is strong. And because it is a very rural society and with a lot of farmers, you know, it's still the majority of farmers use uh, the seeds. And it is uh, very interesting to see that usually, yes, the seeds uh, are not in a commercial market. You cannot buy them. And um, I know that some farmers are not, uh, they are not shocked by the fact that they cannot buy the seeds to a seed uh, company because, um, yeah, it's uh, in most countries, the pharmacy just can be exchanged freely. Or trade, well, yes. Uh, you cannot give money for seed. You can s give seed for seed or receive seed uh, freely, um, but it cannot be uh, sold. Um, so yes, because uh, there are in Senegal there is a proverb which say uh, it's only the one that has no seed that is really poor. And indeed, uh, in a in a f in a very rural society, if you do not have the seed, then that's the ultimate poverty. You know, um, yeah. Right, if there uh, aren't any more questions, um, I would like to thank you very much in the name of uh, Philippe and me and of the whole cohort for a really uh, interesting discussion. I think it was really insightful for all of us. And uh, we wish you all good luck for the, for the, new, um, for the new postdoc to come, exactly. <laughs> thank you very much.